Jonathan Freed, a um, media relations officer here at the New York Fed. I'd like to say good morning to those of you joining us remotely online. Hopefully you'll be able to join us here one day in person or uh, we also look forward to meeting you as we make our way around the region and get to say hello to you in person. So we've got about half an hour or so for questions this morning. And just a reminder, um, we'd like to keep the questions on today's topic and anything on monetary policy is a no-go zone. Okay, Caroline. This on, sorry. Um, Caroline Gage from Bloomberg News. Um, President Dudley, I was hoping that you could elaborate a little bit on your comments on um, the outlook for inflation and why, um, what you're seeing that makes you think uh, inflation is going to fall short of your goals. Well, what we've seen in uh, the recent months is a significant deceleration in inflation pressures as some of the commodity price pressures uh, have abated uh, and as the supply disruptions uh, from Japan uh, that drove up auto prices uh, temporarily have, have, have reversed. Um, so if you look at the, you know, if you look at today's GDP report and look at the uh, PCE def expenditure deflator, you see a very benign, uh, very very low reading for inflation, considerably below the the two percent target that uh, that we expressed. Uh, given the the fact that the commodity price trends looked like they're going to remain quiescent, given this slowdown in global uh, economic growth that's uh, expected to continue in 2012. Uh, and the fact that we have significant slack in the U.S. economy, uh, I, I, I would think that what we saw in the fourth quarter is certainly going to be more indicative of the kind of inflation news that we're going to see in coming quarters than the, than the bu bu little bubble in inflation that we saw around the middle of this year. Hi. Beth Furtig, WMIC Public Radio. I cover education. Ms. Chakrabarty. Um, I have a question for you about at the very end of your report. Can you just sum up for me, please, the details of the cuts during the 2011-2012 school year for New York City and New York State? They looked pretty severe, especially with after school. Well, there was some evidence like I showed you in the last uh, chart. There were some cuts in school expenditure in terms of teachers. Uh, they were not seen as much in New York City, but in other parts there were some evidence of cuts. There were cuts in special education as well. Uh, so there are cuts, and then we are going to monitor the situation for the, this school year, and then maybe we are going to monitor the situation and see how things turn out. So how did, can, can you again just sum up for me, please, because this is for radio, how the federal stimulus funds offset that and now the overall net effect without that in New York? Well, the federal stimulus funds were very helpful to maintain some parts of expenditure, especially instructional expenditure that was preserved in New York especially. But with, the, with basically the federal funds going away, federal stimulus funds going away, there was a much higher pressure on revenues. And there was a sharp decline in revenue or funding after that, after the funds, so the federal funds went away, and that's getting reflected in various services. Did you get the bite? Yes, I did, thank you. You can, you can re-ask if you didn't. I sympathize. You are right? Okay. Thanks. It sounded to me like she got it, though. Yeah, yeah. John? Jonathan Spice with Reuters. Uh, you mentioned in your speech that uh, fiscal policy, housing policy, uh, important pieces to the puzzle here. Uh, is there any sort of indication, or are you getting a sense that that message is getting through uh, from officials like yourself to other uh, government officials? Well, I think the uh, s speech I gave in housing in the Federal Reserve's white paper uh, that, the, that the, the Board of Governors published, uh, I think, did shine a light on some of the things that could be done in the housing uh, space. And I think the administration and Congress is now, you know, evaluating those. Uh, those ideas, and I think we're going to see some some some, some progress in, in in that area. Uh, the fiscal policy obviously is very uh, very more difficult uh, uh, with a you know administration of one party in a Congress uh, 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 in the House controlled by the Republicans uh, in an election year. So we you know I don't think we we're, we we haven't seen uh, very much yet on the on the fiscal front, and that may have to wait until uh, after the election. But we're, you know, we're seeing some movement. Lisa. Lisa Fleischer with the Wall Street Journal. I was wondering, um, Mr. Akabarte, um, 
why did you know did you notice why New Jersey sort of got hit harder in terms of school funding than New York? I mean, did it use the stimulus money for other items? Well, there were various reasons. One, the stimulus money that New Jersey got was considerably less than what New York got. It was about two point two billion in New Jersey, five point six billion in New York, plus New York got the rest of the top funding. And apart from that, even apart from the federal, you have to remember that the federal funds are actually a very small proportion of the total funding that schools get in both New York and New Jersey. But there were steep falls in state aid in New Jersey that are actually very different than what you see in New York. And that was a major reason why you saw declines in total funding in New Jersey. Um, <laughs> uh, I just want for group discounts. <laughs> also about uh, per pupil spending. Um, did you look at why New Jersey and New York's per pupil spending is so high compared to the rest of the nation? We often hear about that from politicians, but they yeah. don't often look at like labor markets or you know the yeah. area of the country. So right. it, can you talk a little bit about that? Again, th there there are various reasons, and basically goes down to the structure, the institutional structure of New York and New Jersey. So one is the cost of living in New York and New Jersey are considerably higher than that, than the average in the nation. And because of that, school staff salaries have to be much higher than elsewhere. Even apart from that, if you look at the composition of the student population in both New York and New Jersey, we actually have many more poor kids, free or reduced price lunch eligible kids, we have many more special education kids. We have many more English language learners or limited English proficient kids. Now, if you look at the funding formula, either the federal funding formula or the state aid formula, they actually factor in these kids. And these kids actually get much more money. As a result of, it's basically a combination of all these factors actually lead to, or have actually historically led to much higher per pupil funding in both New York and New Jersey compared to the nation. Uh, maybe I missed it, but w did you specify what your forecast for growth for this year is? Uh, could you put a no number on that? No, I, I, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I won't. <laughs> Thank you for asking. <laughs> Please push three if you have another question. <laughs> Claudia, did you have something? Yeah, I did. Um, hi there, Claudia Hirsch with Market News. Um, you spoke of tepid U.S. job growth and a dispiriting decline in uh, the labor force. Uh, can you put a little bit more of a fine point on it and tell us what your near-term outlook is on job creation and unemployment in general, both regionally and nationally? Well, we do think the economy is going to grow fast enough to generate, uh, you know, payroll employment growth. So we're expecting uh, in a, uh, uh, to generate growth in employment, and we think it's probably going to be sufficient to generate a very gradual decline in the unemployment rate over the next year or two. So that gives you a sense of sort of strong, but in our view, you know, stronger than maybe what we've seen a year or two ago but not strong to, enough to generate a significant sharp decline in the unemployment rate. So we would expect the unemployment rate to still be, you know, very, you know, quite high at the end of this year. And job growth at what, uh, around this 140,000 mark per month, or? I don't want to put a precise number on it, but I think, you know, something not di that different than what we've been experiencing. I have a question from online from the Star-Ledger. Uh, Raji, it looks like it's for you. It says, Governor Chris Christie talks often about cutting funding for the state's Abbott districts. If the governor were to propose an across-the-board cut in state spending to Abbott districts, what effect would this have on instructional spending? What might this mean for the poor, special ed students in those cities? Okay, so, well, uh, what I can, I can talk from my research. So what I have looked at is the effect on, of actually the recession on Abbott districts. And as you might know, Abbott districts are actually, there are 31 districts in New Jersey. And they typically get more money than the other districts, and that follows from a series of litigations. Uh, 
so, but the other districts actually fared, it's, it's in the research in some of the papers that, is men, that are mentioned here, I didn't show it here, but other districts actually got hit much harder because they actually faced a larger fall in state aid because of that, and that actually had to deal with the cut in the state aid in the mid-year of 2009-10. So other districts, after the recession, they actually got hit harder not just in terms of total funding, but also in terms of instructional expenditure, as well as the various non-instructional categories. So that was what actually happened as a result of the, or after the recession, that, can, that actually comes out pretty clearly from the data. Okay, thanks. And we, of course, note that that was a hypothetical question, and we don't necessarily accept the premise of the question. No <laughs> warranty expressed or implied. <laughs> um, I have one more online. Is there anything else? Question about uh, what is your reaction to someone's assessment, an analyst assessment, that the Fed seems to be panicked, which is why they had to uh, change their forecast from 2013 to 2015 in terms of raising rates? Uh, well, first, we, we, we extended the, uh, the period from uh, mid-2013 to late-2014, so I just want to be clear on that point. Uh, I don't sense any, any panic. Uh, whatsoever among uh, my speaking for myself um, you know, I think that we did an assessment of the economic outlook we saw that under our, our, our growth proje uh, projections that the unemployment rate was going to remain uh, quite high uh, in an environment where the inflation pressures were uh, subsiding uh, and that, re that and that reflect uh, and that's reflected in the change in, in, in our guidance there may be no soup for you <laughs> the monetary policy basket. Okay, okay I have uh, a question from the Bergen Record. Uh, President Dudley mentioned that households have reached the end of this deleveraging process. Is that good news? What does it mean should happen next in terms of spending, the economy, and so on? I think the operative word is may. Uh, the data is consistent with the hypothesis that they may have reached the end of the, the deleveraging process, whether that's Definitive or not, I think we're going to need to see uh, more economic data. Now, if they had, in fact, reached the end of the leveraging process, that will that will be imply that uh, income growth, uh, employment, uh, will really be the main driver of, of, of consumer spending, uh, as well as uh, credit availability. Uh, so I think that uh, you know the signs I think are uh, somewhat hopeful. Uh, but as I've noted in, in earlier speeches, you know, we still have uh, significant impediments, especially uh, in the housing sector, uh, you know, that are not, uh, that, that, that in some ways are impeding uh, the power of monetary policy, you know, the inability of people to uh, uh, easily refinance for those who have uh, high loan-to-value mortgages, for example. Uh, so uh, even, w even if the deleveraging process is coming to an end, that doesn't mean necessarily that the economy is going to be robust as a consequence. Okay, and I just want to say to the folks following online, if you have a follow-up question, um, please feel free to send it in. Uh, we will try to get them in for you. Robert. Robert Slavin, I'm a reporter with the Bond Buyer newspaper. I have a question for uh, Ms. Chakrabarty. Um, anyway, uh, on page 43, it's clear that the uh, overalls real spending per pupil, uh, both in New Jersey and New York City, and presumably New York State as well, has gone up roughly 30% um, to 35% since 2000. It's during the same period, obviously, worker compensation certainly has not gone up by that at all. Uh, so how would you respond to people to say, well, there's been some small cuts particularly in New Jersey, but still, if you look back, going back uh, at least 11 years or 12 years, the overall spending per pupil, in fact, has gone up. So that we perhaps we shouldn't be too concerned about whatever limited cuts there have been in, in the recent years. Well, uh, both expenditure as well as funding goes up on an upward trend, and that's true everywhere in New York, New Jersey, and the nation as well. So what the impact of the cuts can be on education is not, has not been, I have not actually done that part of the research. 
So I can only say that school finances were cut and different categories were cut or not cut, but what the impact would be or what is the link between funding and student learning or student education is not a matter of discussion today. Uh, there is a lot of literature, there is a debate out there, but I'm actually today not focusing on that. Do you have a follow up? Are you okay? Um, yeah, I mean, I have some other small questions about uh, how some of these uh, uh, numbers were defined uh, for Ms. Chakrabarty on page 44. Does the uh, uh, figures include federal spending, or is it just purely state? No, it's there? state and federal, but state, not local. State and federal, okay. Uh, and then I think a page or two before, uh, yes, on page 38, um, on New York total expenditure by poverty, um, how are these areas defined? Is it by county? No, that's that's actually a very good question. So they are actually defined, so it's free reduced lunch, eligible kids that define whether or not a, an area is poor. And I look at the entire distribution of free reduced lunch kids in New Jersey or New York, and I basically say if you are 75% or above in terms of poverty, you are a high poverty area. District if you are by districts, yeah, by school districts. And if you are 25% or below, then you are, you are low poverty. And in the middle, if you lie between 25 and 75, you are a medium poverty district. And that's how I define, both in New York and New Jersey, the affluent, medium poverty, and high poverty. John, okay. do you have one? Uh, if I, I hate to, just uh, one more little follow up on this. You know what, I, um, okay. I'm sure she would be very happy to I'll make talk to later. later. As soon as we're okay. done. Thanks. I just want to spread the wealth around. Okay. <laughs> John, did you have one? Maybe trying to get in into dangerous territory, but uh, I mean, uh, after the two transparency steps this week uh, uh, with the inflation target and the rate forecast, I'm just wondering if there's any more, you know, that you see on the horizon. Um, Maybe that's well over the line. <laughs> I was going to say, if, if President Dudley were in the room, he might. I don't see him now, though. He seems to have disappeared. <laughs> we understand why you need to try. Uh, anybody else? Caroline? Um, in your speech, um, the, the speech you gave on January 6th on the housing, um, were you surprised by the criticism that, that you got from that from um, some senators? And how do you weigh, um, you know, talking about fiscal issues like that with your role as a, a monetary policymaker? You know, I wouldn't consider that what I was talking about about housing were fiscal issues. I think we were, we were, I was talking about issues that were basically impairing. Uh, the ability of monetary policy to support economic activity, so directly germane to the Federal Reserve. And also, I think that, uh, as, as the speech, I think, tried to make very clear that we think that a lot of, the, most of the things that we were proposing would essentially pay for themselves, so it's not obvious to us that there's a, any mean, meaningful fiscal cost. And three, it's, this, is, this is not us doing these policies, this is us making public policy suggestions that we think would actually help us achieve our dual mandate of maximum sustainable employment in the context of price stability. So it seems to me that if there are impediments to the economy that are making monetary policy not, effect, not as effective as it could be, that are keeping us farther away from achieving our objectives of the dual mandate, then it seems to me that it's, it's the responsible thing to do is to, is to put those on the table for people to discuss them. Now, I'm, you know, I don't think it's surprising that some people agree and some people disagree. And I think my goal here was not really to cause any sort of controversy, but to create a, a, a discussion and examine deeper discussion and examination of these issues to see if a consensus could be reached on some of these points that what might actually be helpful for the economy, for households and businesses in the United States. Anybody else? I'm Imachi of uh, uh, Japanese news press, uh, GG, AG Press. And we now see a historical low mid-term interest rate after FMC. So what kind of effect on the economy do you expect by that? 
Well, we're trying to follow a monetary policy that's very s supportive of economic activity because we have a uh, unacceptably high unemployment rate and inflation is uh, is quite subdued. Uh, the, p the point is not to keep these interest rates at these levels indefinitely. The point is to generate an economic recovery so we can normalize the interest rates in the future. Yes, Lisa. Um, Ms. Takabarti, you said generally that um, the outlook doesn't remain, you know, it isn't particularly rosy for schools in the future. Uh, can you explain a little bit more about that and why you think that's the case? Well, uh, various reasons. One is the federal funding is drying up, the federal stimulus money. On the, on the other hand, if you look at the budgeted numbers that I put up, they actually show a decline. So a combination is like there are three particular sources of funding, federal, state, and local. So neither of them actually look very rosy. So the total picture probably is not very rosy. And this is including, you know, how many years into the future now for, for states? Because I think state funding in particular, people say might, you know, increase as the economy improves. Sure. If the, if, they, if, if the economy improves, then local as well as state funding should increase. And if the economy improves, then the picture would be very, very different. Do you think that state or local funding would increase Well, faster? both. State and local both would increase because the state funds come from income taxes, sales right. taxes, and that's dependent on the economy. The local funds are based on property taxes. That's also dependent on the economy, the housing market. So with the economy getting better, these things should be, should also get better. Okay, anybody else? Okay. Oh, you do? Go ahead. Hi, Deborah Levine from Market Watch. This is for Mr. Dudley. Um, can you comment on how you think people take how the Fed talks about the economy? Does it ever worry you that talking about how long unemployment will be bad and so on will actually make things worse, or could at least? It's pretty close to the line of a monetary policy question, yeah. but let me, let me try to answer that anyway. I, I think that you know, we look at the, you know, basically broadly the same set of information that private forecasters look at uh, and, and make our conclusions on the basis of that information. So I don't think you should take the Fed's outlook as a signal of some, uh, something being significantly better or worse, depending on what our forecast is relative to other, other forecasters. So this idea that the Federal Reserve has sort of special information that, you know, give an independent read on the economy, I think that I would want to downplay, downplay that notion. Okay. We are pretty well at the end of the allotted period anyway, so I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. If you have any extra questions offline, I know Raji and Jason are probably around. Uh, Robert, you might have a couple. And with that, I would like to thank all of you for coming, and we look forward to the next briefing. Thank you. Thank you.